What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the Quarantine Zone again, and this time we are here with Eric of the Almighty Eclipse. Great to talk with you again. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's a pleasure, of course. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. So the last time I spoke to you, it was like mainly towards the ending cycle of Paradigm. We uh, weren't expecting a brand new uh, Eclipse album coming out in 2021, Wired. How was the making of this album sort of be? Was this meant to be sort of like just a productive thing to keep you all busy? Uh, during the time of quarantine, uh, how did Wired sort of see the light of day? It uh, it actually followed the plan. I think the original plan was already to release this this, uh, this uh, spring, but due to the pandemic, we kind of waited until the autumn. But uh, well, the pandemic isn't over yet, but uh, <laughs> hopefully in the future. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Yeah. Did, did maybe yeah. uh, everything that we went through the past uh, couple of years uh, maybe influence what we're going to be hearing on this album? Because the first three singles uh, I heard definitely give it a little bit of edge. It represents maybe a time that's better, uh, represents the desire for better times. That's sort of my interpretation of it. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't want to. We didn't want to write a depressive record. We wanted to write the record for the you know the post. Covid world. I think this is the album you want to have listen to with with friends while having drinks. Yeah, it's definitely a fun album to listen to, and definitely a reminds us of much better days. Do you feel that the first three singles that you released, Saturday Night, uh, Twilight, and Bite the Bullet, maybe serve as a good representation of what all of Wired is going to sound like, or is there a lot more to be discovered on this album? Yeah, well, well, it's it's drums, guitars, and vocals, so it's it's kind of the same, of course. But I think there's it's a very diverse record. It's there's a, it's you know it's it's all from ballads to to really heavy heavy guitar tracks. And um, for me, you know, choosing singles is always super hard because you know it's I I like all the songs. Otherwise, it wouldn't be on the record. And it, it's always hard also with, with a single because everyone, you know. They they read in so much into a single track. They they think it's 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 the best songs from the record. For us, it's more like it's one of the songs. I always think more album than singles. To be honest, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I've always thought that maybe like the singles release the purpose, especially when a band releases like seven singles before the album's already out or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it yeah, and it's it's really hard with. With streaming, it's like if you release the, the whole album at once, it's just be, the, the first three songs are going to be played and the rest is going to be forgotten. So I, I can understand that people release track by track because it actually gives some more kind of the credit they deserve because people will pay attention for, to them. But but also you lose the whole impact of the record when it actually drops. So. When it comes to picking a single, I mean, I know it's kind of like a business-oriented question, but is that a, does that is that decided by the band or is that like a label decision? It, it is a discussion. The labels have their favorites, and the band we got our favorites, and and also the, it also comes into if the song is too long, it's uh, you know we would love to have like a run for cover. It's one of, it's track four on the record. Uh, it's one of the favorites from the band, but it's it's a bit too long. It, because you know they, they won't be playlisted on Spotify or uh, and those services, so it's uh, those are kind of poor choices because it's too long. Uh, and but it's yeah, I, I, you never choose the right singles. But but at, in the end, when you when the album's been out, you know, a year or two, and you go and you play at concerts, you know which songs that will stand the test of time and which songs the fans like. And it's it sometimes it's the song that's really appreciated live was never a single. So it's well, I'll tell you this run for cover is one of my favorite uh, songs on this album. So it's uh, awesome. Oh, cool. to hear you say it. And it, really, the reason is because it's too long. That can't be released as singles. Do you think we could ever get like another Bohemian Rhapsody sort of situation? I mean, with how long that was. Yeah, well, it, it, I, I think it was. Uh, it was unbelievable that it was a hit even back in the day, but uh, well, I don't know. You know, the, the interest span of a normal person clicking on on Spotify is it, if, if the, the chorus doesn't hit within four to seconds, it's they kind of <laughs> you know, change to next track. Uh, but but having said that, you know, we of course you know you can you can think singles and you can think streaming, but there is a reality where we actually have real fans 
people who love music the way we do, who create it and then, you know, listen to music, like deep listening to music. And, and, and those are the fans that, you know, it's that are most important, of course. Yeah, of course. And I, I've always yeah. like wondered because like everything is meant to, I, I feel like you want to start the songwriting process with the intention of every song being a single who like, in a way, when yeah. some people think, oh, great, you have these three singles. So does the, re is the rest of the album like a dud? Like, yeah, but I, 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 especially when I was younger, when you spent a lot of money on, on records, you never, you just took a chance and you bought a record and you, uh, you know, you never had, I never had any money. So when I, when I spent money on a record, I was so many times I was so disappointed because it was like two, maybe three tracks that were great. And there was a lot of, those you know just filler tracks and i i kind of i, I don't want to be that band releasing records like that yeah you know i'm i feel like you know and even nowadays it's even more obsolete like i'm, I'm telling my uh 10 year old niece that i used to get my music off of itunes and she's like what's itunes i'm like well back in my day <laughs> back in my day if you wanted the bonus track on the album you had to buy the whole album and i remember setting my alarm clock for 11 59 p.m just so i could be the first uh person to download those mp3s back in the back in those yeah. days yeah that's yeah it's wonderful yeah you know uh we, we we we've got we've taken it quite far this time we we released two different colored vinyls it's like it's a super the vinyl looks looks gorgeous it's super deluxe it's it's really a really beautiful looking vinyl we got it in two colors and we even got you know the cd of course and we also got the cassette which is super fun <laughs> those those are going to be like artifacts yeah I, I actually i we actually got the album i got it today so i the first thing I did was pop the, the the cassette into the cassette player. I actually got an old boombox in my studio. Really? Those still exist? I've always said that there should be like a metal parody video of like a mixtape, like an old school tape, and it's like an Indiana Jones like artifact. You have to wave your hands over it to make sure that if you grab it, like a booby <laughs> trap doesn't come down. Yeah, but it, we, we only, I think a record label just did 200, you know, because we didn't think anyone would buy it. But even... The, like like a month ago it was already sold out wow that's so people was like yeah <laughs> and we just couldn't stop laughing it was like people actually bought it it was and we were super excited of course about it but you know but you know, yeah. i guess more people were <laughs> well I, I there is sort of like a collector thing i mean people are such hoarders nowadays people love to have like that when people get a vinyl they, they open that up it feels like they have like a sacred piece of art i think that aspect yeah. of vinyl will never go away and i mean this is obviously an apples and oranges scenario, but people love the presentations of albums as much as the album itself. That like, yeah. like people get angry when they like um, have a song uh, that they downloaded from the internet and like you know the album artwork is missing or something like that. People feel like something's missing. So I think the love for the presentation of an album is never going to go away. Absolutely, and it's. Uh... I think the vinyl is the ultimate presentation of a, of a of a record. It's it's so you know the size is perfect. The pictures these are they're big pictures. You can really have a look at it. You can read all the lyrics in, in you know you don't have to like have a binocular to to read the lyrics. You can really actually see all things in in a big scale and yeah, the whole thing is just it's a beautiful artwork. I think that's why it survived. Yeah. Definitely. I could so, see yeah. the I could see like some of these amazing album artworks. Like I love the album artwork for Wired and like I could like some of these album like I could see like art galleries just putting a bunch of vinyl on the wall and people appreciating it for the artwork in itself. Absolutely, yeah. I, I fully agree. I got over seven hundred vinyls. I actually uh, been a quite a collector. And I, I have this old seventies stereo which sounds amazing. You can think that new speakers would they would sound crap but they actually sound really really good so it's going back to like the wired album did you almost consider yep. this just the appropriate continuation of paradigm like do you almost feel that like if people really want to get the full notion of what to expect on wired like somebody's just discovering eclipse now they should go back and listen to paradigm and maybe listen to monumentum and you know like listen to the older stuff or or could it like did, can a listener just focus on wired for now they don't need to like go back uh, to understand this well i to be honest I, i'm really happy with all the albums we've done this one is it's it's very energetic it's it's got a more like a, a a rock and roll vibe to the whole record which we haven't had really 
that much before. We have, of course, we always had that, you know, that, you know, if you know what I mean, with a rock and roll, kind of that high energy, not so kind of super technical about it. And uh, we always try to, you know, not be too technical and try to be at least, at least a little sloppy in the studio to, to make it sound alive. But I think we've managed somehow, we are closer, Wired is closer to the live experience of Eclipse yeah. uh, than on previous records, yeah. I definitely consider this to be the most raw Eclipse record. That that was my analysis of it. It had a very raw vibe behind it. Like I, 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 you know, I've always thought Eclipse's sound was very epic and massive. That I could like see you guys play in like an arena and really get the audience engaged. But like when I hear Wired, I just want to see you guys play in like an underground like shithole club in a way. You know? Yeah, and I think that the whole uh, artwork just represents that. You know, the club gig. You know, if you know, I I don't want to see I I don't want to see ACDC in a stadium. I would love to see them in a club. You know, how amazing wouldn't that be? Yeah, I mean, all of those like tours, like you know, Megadeth played uh, at a Saint Vitus like back in 2016, and you know, they were playing in like a small club. Anthrax played there, and like a lot of you know bands that would play in like massive arenas sometimes like to do little one-off shows where they play in like a small club and you just get like a whole new intimate vibe behind it like i've noticed that after a band does like those little clubs there's like a newfound appreciation for them yeah absolutely and and uh, yeah because that's what it's all about because you if, if 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 you play two you know big festivals it can be fantastic you can play in front of no, 15, 20,000 people, but you can never, it's, it's just, it's like a fantasy. It's, 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 you know, you can't connect to those people. They are, it's so distant. It's so big stages, but when you play smaller stages, of course, uh, it's, um, you, 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 you are, you know, this, my sweat is, <laughs> is coming over the people in the, in the front row and, and it's just, it's super, it's more intense. But uh, having said that, I would love to play arenas as well. I think they w it would pay the bills but more. Yeah. <laughs> Easier to pay the bills. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I think like people like say it's like, well, small clubs are better or arenas are better. I think you really can't compare the two. I think they're two completely different experiences. You do a, you do a completely different show. If you have a big, if you play the, you know, the big festival stages, uh, that is as close as, as arenas we play. It's, you know, you have to do a completely different show. It's just running around, making it look big, bigger and better than, than it actually is. And, and in clubs, you can more like, yeah, it's, it's more in, intense and it's very, you know, personal. Definitely. Now, there's a lot to celebrate with Eclipse this year because this year is the 20-year anniversary of the debut Eclipse album, The Truth and a Little More. I mean, could we maybe get like a celebration of this of some sort? Can you maybe see you guys doing like an anniversary tour, or is that just like not uh, really much of interest? Uh, more to later. I'm 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 never been a fond of like looking back. I I just move ahead for. I just look forward. I I don't. People have been asking. Maybe you can re-record some of the old songs, but. No, it's it. No, those songs are crap. It's like why bother spending time on those songs when I can, you know, write new ones that are a hundred times better. Well, I mean, I, I think the truth and a little more. Like I've always said, it has the debut charm behind it. When you see like a lot of bands' debut albums, like very rarely does a band ever become massive off a debut album. In fact, off the top of my head, the only two bands I could think of that got huge off their debut were Guns N' Roses, and thanks to your shirt, that helped yeah. me remember it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and and Lincoln Park. Those were the only two bands that I really remember getting massive off of their debut albums. But um, I, I think that the truth in a little more has like a debut charm behind it. You don't think of ever going back and maybe bringing out a couple deep cuts off that album for the next Eclipse show? Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe. Uh, it's. Uh, I've, I've been very. I've been very against it. And I, I know the guitar player Magnus, who was on the band on the, on the debut album as well uh he is also very much against it and we we have refused to re-release it as well we actually gave the opportunity uh like to label because uh, we own the rights ourselves and uh and um we we offered them you can you can only do it on cassette that's the only <laughs> rights you can have to it oh really <laughs> but but uh, and that was like five six years ago and they were like uh no not interested thank you <laughs> <laughs> fair enough so i'm guessing next yeah. year being the 10-year anniversary of bleed and scream is also out of the question right 
uh, Bleed and Scream is another thing. I, I really like that record. That was that's the first record we done that which I was. It sounded professional. I was super proud of it. So. Okay, so maybe a little more deep cuts off of that next year for the ten year. Absolutely, that is. Uh, it's a completely different animal. <laughs> I, I I still I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna if we when we do more interviews in the future, I'm gonna remind you about the truth in a little more now, just because I, I I do admire <laughs> your honesty uh, actually for your um, yeah. earlier material. Some people are afraid to admit that, but uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be yeah. on you about that. May, just consider it, consider it, maybe yeah. sleep on it for a couple nights. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll consider it. Yeah. Okay. Now speaking yeah. of your Guns and Roses shirt, I've noticed the user illusion. That's the user illusion uh, uh, album artwork, yep. right? Okay. So. I'm I'm kind of like a minority in this uh, opinion, but just nerding out on music, I've always liked the Use Your Illusion albums a little bit more than Appetite for Destruction. I mean, are you? Do you agree with that? Or? Same here. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I, I really like the Use Your Illusion. I think there, people say that. Yeah, if you would have made one album out of the two, it would have been a great album. And I think that they're, they're both really good. Yeah. I've always said that, like, it, it, because, you know, Appetite for Destruction was very in your face, with the exception of Sweet Child of Mine, of course. But, like, uh, you know, I feel like that was a very badass, you know, down and dirty rock vibe. I always thought that Use Your Illusion really had, you know, with songs like Civil War or something like that, that, you know, was really in your yeah. face and down and dirty. But the way that November Rain and those ballads um, and The Garden, which I think is the most underrated Guns N' Roses song, I've always thought was so like massive. It showed sides of like one of the greatest, different sides of one of the greatest rock bands ever. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think that those two records are really, really good. I, I agree with you that, you know, the Appetite for Destruction is of course a, a fantastic record, uh, but uh, it's, it, the other ones are so diverse. The songwriting is just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, what, do you have any like fond memories of that uh, time going back into 1991? Yeah, I, this is the, you know, I my brother bought Use Illusion Two on CD, and I thought it was fantastic. And it, you know, it, uh, it's the same year as Metallica Black Album. Back then, we didn't buy, you know, you bought a few records every year that you, that you could afford, and uh, at least not, never more than once one record a month. And I, yeah, those, yeah, I, I just, I, I was really young, but I, I think it was a fantastic record from the start. Yeah, definitely. So uh, before we go, I do want to thank you so much for your time today and uh, for such a great conversation. It was great to really nerd out like on vinyl and music and stuff. I, think I don't get to have those discussions yeah. that often. Uh, is there just anything else with Eclipse that you would like to promote for the release of Wired, uh, you know, when this fucking virus that shall not be named is finally behind us? Will, could you maybe consider bringing Eclipse to the U.S. one day? Uh, yeah, that would have been that would be great. We, we had to cancel. We, we were supposed to play a, a festival called Monsters of the Mountain in october but we had to cancel it because the, we couldn't get visas and we are not allowed to travel to america without a, a two-week quarantine so it's like we can't sit waiting in a hotel for two weeks before for the show it's a bit yeah hard to do so um well we play most of rock cruise next year hopefully that will happen and uh, yeah we are we actually talked about maybe doing uh, like at least a small run in america while we're you know doing those festivals so uh, fingers crossed we'll make it happen next year awesome well thank you so much do, do you have a lockdown do you have a lockdown right now no not at the moment in fact i'm going to i've been to a couple of shows recently and it's all been fantastic but you know there's been strict rules you have to prove that you're vaccinated or have a negative test before you can enter the venue um masks are recommended but not in, that's like the jaywalking law is more enforced than that at the moment and uh um, but, you know, there's still plenty of restrictions and stuff, but uh, slowly but surely. I mean, there are festivals, like Louder Than Life Festival is happening in Kentucky this week. Um, so, okay, cool. but, you know, tours have been getting canceled if, like, one member contracts the uh, contracts the virus. So, like, uh, you know, it's it's a very up-in-the-air sort of thing. It's yeah. it's an uncertain It's yeah, an it's uncertain very vulnerable. Field. Yeah, but we're, we're pulling through. We're pulling through. It's, uh, it may... Yeah. One thing I've noticed is is that with the possibility of shows always getting canceled and stuff, people appreciate the shows a lot more. Like I see the venue packed for the opening bands now. I see, you know, every show has been almost sold out. 
people are you know going crazy and savoring it you don't see people like leaving the shows like in the last couple of songs or something like that so there's a newfound appreciation for it i could tell you that that's uh, yeah. definitely something to look forward to yeah which of course we, we discussed earlier during the before everything started to open up but are, are people going to be scared in the future to be in the same room or you know hanging out standing too close to each other because it's but, but, but we played a festival in Belgium like four weeks ago, and it was a like a twenty thousand open air festival. And you had to, ha you know, you had to have your vaccine uh, proof or, or you know, like a, a PCR test it was called. And when we came in there, it was like, it was like a time machine back two thousand nineteen. People were like partying, hanging out together, having a really good time, and that was really good to see that. It's kind of took away my fears that people are would be scared of going to concerts. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who are like a little like, you know, what am I doing here? Is this safe? Is this OK? But like, I think I think it's going to be one of those things as it happens more and more and more. I think it, the fear is going to, you know, it's it's like after 9-11 when people were afraid to do anything after that. So like, I think yeah. in after a while, like, you know, and even after the Paris attacks in France, I mean, people were scared to go to concerts for a while, but then slowly but surely you know yeah. they got over it so i think this is kind of one of those situations as well yeah 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 wonderful that's good news yeah we open up sweden on 29th of september we open up for concerts okay. completely like back to like it used to be yeah so, so but, but it takes a while to book concerts so it's like it's not like we can play a gig on the 29th we can it just takes forever to book gigs and promote them and sell tickets and stuff so it's yeah yeah, for those of you listening, yeah. every concert that you see announced was probably booked two years ago, uh, even without a pandemic. Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, and I, 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 you know, we our festival summer for twenty twenty was fully booked, and everything has just been pushed you now to twenty one, now pushed to twenty two. So bands who ha who wasn't booked for twenty twenty, they have to wait even longer. It must be yeah terrible for them. Yeah, it's funny though seeing like the anniversary tours rescheduled when they say like twentieth anniversary and then they re-release the flyer with like an X over the twenty and put twenty first anniversary and then yeah. so we, we we thought about releasing a tour T-shirt for for twenty you know twenty twenty and twenty twenty one and just do all the gigs and just cancel for everyone the whole the whole back just cancel. Ooh, <laughs> that might be a collector's item. You might be onto something there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we thought about doing it, but it's <laughs> kind of fun. Yeah. But uh, again, Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Everybody, thank you so much. Eric of Eclipse, be sure to check out Wired coming out October via Frontiers. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We will see you next time. See you next time.